Hi, I'm Peter Adamson, and you're listening to the History of Philosophy podcast, brought to you with the support of King's College London and the LMU in Munich, online at www.historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode will be an interview about freedom in Peter Abelard, and I'll be joined by John Marinbon, who is Senior Research Fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge, here for his record-equaling third appearance on the podcast. Hi, John. Hello. Hello. Uh, so maybe first you can just remind us who Peter Abelard was. Right. Abelard is probably the most important and certainly the most controversial philosopher of the 12th century. He's born in 1079, and his work really spans the first four decades of the 12th century. Up until about 1120, he's working mainly on logic. After that, he interests himself increasingly in theology, and he writes a variety of theological works, and also they one work which is very striking in its form because it consists of um, a dialogue involving a philosopher, so somebody who's a bit like a, a pagan philosopher who talks first to a Jew and then to a Christian. But we're not going to be talking about that That's treatise. That's true, yes. Actually, I've already mentioned that anyway. What we are going to be talking about is freedom and ideas like contingency and necessity exactly. in Peter Abelard. Yes. And this is something I've already tackled several times on the podcast and pretty recently, in fact, in the context of Latin medieval philosophy, because I talked about Eriogena's views on predestination. And when I was introducing Anselm, I talked about his views on freedom and what freedom of the will would consist in. Now, Abelard's not responding directly to Eriogena and Anselm, that's right? That's right, yes. I mean, a- a- Abelard's discussion um, comes out of um, looking at Aristotle's On Interpretation, chapter 9 of that, Boethius's commentary on the Aristotle, and then also Boethius's Constellation of Philosophy, book 5, where Boethius himself is looking back, at least in part, to that Aristotelian logical tradition. And presumably he knows the Aristotle in Boethius's Latin translation as well. Exactly, yes. And the reason why this comes up in this context is that in the famous ninth chapter of On Interpretation, yeah. Aristotle presents an argument for determinism, which he then refutes. And yeah. down to today, there's not a lot of agreement about what exactly the deterministic argument is, nor is there agreement exactly, about yes. what the solution yes. is. Can you sketch what the basic problem is, just to remind people, even though I have looked at this before? Right. So the... I mean, the background problem, the, so Aristotle's problem, is just that if we say there's going to be a sea battle, there'll be a sea battle tomorrow, and if we consider that every proposition is either false or true, so it seems that we've got to say, well, that's either false or true. We may not, we don't know which it is, but supposing it's true, then there's going to be a sea battle tomorrow. Supposing it's false, there isn't. So it seems that just by thinking of, 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 of logic, um, we've established that there's no contingency with regard to whether or not that sea battle takes place. Um, because if it's already true now, then exactly, it's too yes. late to do yeah. anything about yes. it, as it yes. were. Um, of course, one way out of that, and some, some people think that that was the way Aristotle took, and some people deny it, is, is just to deny the principle of bivalence, let's say deny that, this prop- that the proposition does have to be false or true, and and say that with regard to future contingent propositions, they're they're neither. But I guess that solution is off the table if you have divine omniscience, right? Well, exactly. So so the the problem which really concerns um, Abelard, and which concerns Boethius, especially in the Constellation of Philosophy, exactly is what happens when you bring in um, a god who knows all things. Why not just say that God doesn't know the future, though? I mean, why couldn't he know all the things that there are to know, which means all the past things and all the present things, and maybe the future things that are necessary, like one plus one will still equal two tomorrow? It's, I mean, it's difficult to answer that in that I don't think anybody took the view of saying that simply future contingents aren't among the things which are there to be known. It was always considered that it would detract from God's omniscience, and I, suppose, I think there's a certain sort of common sense in that. It, it does seem... It, it, if, if some being knows all that's going to happen in the future, this being seems obviously to, to know more than a being who, who doesn't. Right, so just the fact that there could be truths to know is already 
going to give them a big push in yeah, the direction of exactly. saying that God yeah. knows them. Yeah. Okay. And how does Abelard then set up the problem? Is that basically his way into it? Yeah. So that that's that's basically his his way into it. If we put his way of stating it, so that we can then see how he he gets out of it. I suppose it's quite important that that in his way of stating it, um, he rather forgets the temporal element. So we're in fact talking about God's knowledge of the future. But his his way of stating the problem is to say that um, if if God or indeed if if anybody knows a proposition, then that proposition is true because you can only know what is true in, in virtue of the meaning of no. This is surely something which is necessarily the case because we're not just talking about an accident, we're talking about what, what something must be in order to be known. So we can say that necessarily if God knows some proposition P, then P is true. And then the problem is, is put in terms of, well, doesn't that mean, therefore, that P is necessary? Right, so this wouldn't only apply to future facts, so it would also mean if God yeah. knows that there was yes. a sea battle yesterday, then necessarily there was a sea battle yesterday yes. as well. Uh, that's right, but of course that doesn't seem to be such a problem, because um, although there's a certain sense in which we want to say that yesterday's sea battle wasn't necessary, there's also a certain sense from now in which it is necessary, and there's nothing we can do about it. And one could say the same about the present, too. But when you consider this with regard to the future, it seems to be a problem, because we, we want to say now well, it's, it's open whether or not the sea battle is going to take place. When you frame the argument this way, how much work is being done by the fact that we're talking about knowledge? Imagine that I say I now have a true belief, but not knowledge that there will be a sea battle tomorrow. There's evidence concerning it, and I've checked with the generals and the admirals, and they all have assured me that there will be a sea battle. So I believe now truly that there will be a sea battle tomorrow. Would that not raise the same problems? Because it's um, true now. So, yeah, yeah, no, it, sorry. It would raise the same problems if, if we can take it that it's true. So I don't think the... No, a, a lot of accounts of knowledge are that it's true belief plus something or other. It's not a, and the important thing, I think, in setting up this problem is, is the, the truth of it. However, the way when you're to, saying, well, the admirals have assured me, it seems you're not talking about a true belief, but simply about a belief for which we have a very great deal of evidence. Um, uh, so it's highly probable that it will turn out to be true. And of course, there's no problem about that. Well, what I was imagining was a case where it's a justified belief, and in addition, it happens to be true. And although I can't be sure that it's true, in fact, it is true. So what I was wondering, in other words, is whether the necessity is supposed to flow from the thought that anything I know must be incapable of being otherwise, because that's what knowledge is like. And that wouldn't be true of true belief. Well, yeah, yes. I, perhaps perhaps casting that in terms of true belief in that way is, is a first step on the way to the, in a way, rather simple, but also, as it turns out, an adequate solution that Abelard proposes. Because what, what Abelard has, which Boethius doesn't have, is a notion of, sort of operating on propositions. So if we take a, a, a complex proposition such as, um, if it's day, it's light, and then we think about um, negating it, Boethius, it seemed, could only think of negating each or both of its parts. So, if it's not day, it's light, or if it's day, it's not light, or if it's not day, it's not light. But what Abelard realises is that you can do something which is different, which you, you can say that the whole of that isn't true. That's to say this, this doesn't follow from that. Once you start to think in that way, you can see that in, in, in this problem, there's a distinction between... Um, the true proposition that necessarily the whole of what follows is necessary if someone knows P then P and we accept that and the distinction between that and putting the necessity operator before P so it doesn't follow from that that necessarily P 
So it's like the difference between saying necessarily colon, if it's now true that there will be a sea battle tomorrow, then there will be a sea battle tomorrow. Yeah. And on the other hand, yeah. saying if it's now true that there will be a sea battle tomorrow, then necessarily right. there will be a sea battle exactly, tomorrow. Exactly, yes. That's yeah. where you put the necessity, yes. whether yes. it's yes. applying to the whole inference yeah. or the yes. actual event of yes. the sea battle. Yeah. And then Abelard applies this to get out of the deterministic argument. So how exactly does that work? Well, so, I mean, his, his point would be that um, just because God knows everything, including whether there'll be a sea battle tomorrow or not, and there, there is a connection of necessity between God's knowing things and their happening, this doesn't mean that they happen necessarily. It's just necessary that if he knows it, yeah, them, exactly, then yes, they happen. Yeah, just as it's necessary that if I know something... It, 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 it will happen or it happens. The thing is, though, I can't know future contingents. Whereas God can. Whereas God can. So, but, I mean, Abelard considers that he's solved the problem, but he's only really solved, or well, thinks he's solved the problem, because he's, as I said at the beginning, removed the temporal element from it. So it's, the, I mean, the, the, I think one can see it commonsensically that, um, it, it's not nearly the, it's not nearly so worrying that somebody should know what's happening now, and we don't we don't feel there's a problem about that removing contingency. Whereas th there does seem to really to be a problem about somebody knowing what's happening in the future, if that's supposed and and also supposing that's contingent that that might or might not happen, because. It, it seems, if we're insisting that, that God now knows what's going to happen in the future and that that's contingent in the future, then it seems that that's, um, something in the future must have the power to make what God supposedly knows now into not knowledge but false belief. Otherwise, how could it be contingent? So what you're saying is, if let's change the example. Yeah. Let's say the example, so because I can't really stage sea battles. No. I don't know about you. But I do have the power to have eggs for breakfast tomorrow morning. Exactly, yes. Taking that example, I guess what you're saying is something like this. Given that tomorrow morning it will be up to me whether or not I have eggs, exactly. yeah. it would be in my power tomorrow morning retroactively to make yeah. God have had a false belief today about whether I would have eggs or not. Exactly, yes. Yeah. And that's really bad. Yes, and, that, and, 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 and that, that, that's really bad. And... I and mean, if you want to see why the, the why Abelard's logical analysis um, won't get round that, then what you need to consider is that it, it's let's consider God's belief about your your eggs, um, and it's not just a matter that um, God now has a belief about how many eggs are going to have tomorrow morning. Um, God, God had that belief yesterday. In fact, he had it from all eternity. There's a sense in which that belief is necessary, not necessary in a straightforward sense, but, as people said, accidentally necessary, because it, it, it's in the past. God, God has come to that belief. And so it's not just a belief, it's, it, it, it's knowledge. So, he's, so God has that knowledge, and that, that's, because of the past, is necessary. So what we have is both that necessarily, if God knows P, then P, but also we've got that um, necessarily God knows P with the necessity of the past. And most people would admit that you can... Uh, uh, in, in those cases, you, as it were, transfer necessity so so that you can then validly deduce necessarily P. Okay, so thinking about that in a slightly less yeah, technical right. way, we could say that if God already knew yesterday and indeed from eternity that yeah. I'll have eggs tomorrow for yeah. breakfast, then although it's not too late for me to do anything about having eggs tomorrow for breakfast, it is too late for me to stop God from knowing that I'll have eggs tomorrow for breakfast. And if I can't stop him from knowing that then I can't do otherwise with respect to having the eggs. Is that basically the problem? Yeah, exactly. That, I mean, that's, it, he, we've read it's knowledge, and we've read it's in the past 
so you can't change it. Because he can't have been wrong, and it's past. Yeah. So, it's, so do anything exactly. About it. So in, in fact, after all, and despite Abelard's helpful bit of logic, you know, you, you've got to have those six eggs or whatever. God, <laughs> on you. I'm sorry. Oh no. <laughs> yes. I'm glad it's just yes. you and not God telling me that. Uh, and, of course, that's good in a sense because future medieval philosophers are going to keep discussing this, so this leaves room for them to say something interesting about it. Exactly, yes. And, I mean, they, they do see that Abelard didn't succeed in, in dealing with the problem, and they come up with all sorts of clever ways of trying to deal with it, though, though whether any of them are successful or, or not, um, it's hard to say. But Abelard, I, I mean, I'd, I'd quite like to say something about another aspect of the problem of freedom where uh, Abelard might be more successful, certainly he's very successful in formulating an interesting problem, and I think that he p- proposes an interesting solution to it. This is a problem about freedom which comes from a somewhat different direction, not just from thinking about the logic of propositions that are true or, or false, and then putting in God's knowledge, but thinking about uh, the nature of God and his ways of acting. Because it, it's agreed among all medieval Christians that God is omnipotent, and also that he's completely benevolent. He, so he always wants to do the best thing. But then Abelard says, and this is, this, is, this is something which he becomes very interested in in the, the middle of his career, when he's moved away from, from just doing logic. And so if you like, mo- moved on from the discussion which we were um, looking at before. So let, let, let's, let's consider God and how, how he acts. Well, at every juncture, he has to do whatever's best. But if he has to do whatever, whatever's best, then he has no alternative choices. Because he knows what's act. best, too. Because exactly, he knows what's best. He can't get it wrong. And there's also no chance of his saying, well, I'd, I'd like to do this, but I can't because God's omnipotent. Oh, right, OK. So He's stuck. God, ca- <laughs> God, God cannot do other than he does. And so, actually, we possess more freedom than he does. Actually, he doesn't possess any freedom at all, because well, he has to do exactly the best thing at every moment throughout eternity. Th- yes, I mean, that, that, that's right. And I, what, what you just said, I think, is indeed what Abelard will come down um, to saying in the end. But you would... I mean, you you might think that that's not the case, and 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 you you might think that because God is just acting of necessity, and we're used to thinking when we when we have a Christian thinker that God in some way is arranging all things. So if if, if God acts of necessity and God is omnipotent, then surely there's going to be no room for us to. Oh, so it's act. even worse. So we're well, not free either. <laughs> that 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 could that could be the problem, and. It, what's interesting is Abelard puts that um, to himself in, in, in the form of a particular objection to the view that he's trying to propound. To, to propound. And he, he, I mean, he recognises that this view, that God cannot do other than he does, is a very strange view, and uh, uh, other thinkers haven't held it in, in, in the past. And he knows he's going to be criticised for it, as indeed he was, um, but nonetheless he wants to put it forward. But he, he, he does put forward this objection to it. He's talking about um, somebody who, as a matter of fact, is going to be damned because he, he's led an evil life and he deserves to be damned. So take this, this um, person who's going to be damned. This is, he calls it, this damnandus. Christian doctrine requires, nonetheless, that we say that it's possible for him to be saved by God because... We, if he's going to be saved, it's going to be by God. And if we were to deny that it was possible for him to be saved, then we, we'd be saying that whatever he did, he couldn't be saved. And that would certainly be against Christian doctrine. We know, as a matter of fact, he's not going to do the right things, and so he's not going to be saved, but he might do them. And so, if it's the case that um, it's possible that he'll be saved by God, surely it's the case that it's possible that God will save him because for him to be saved by God means the same as for God to save him. And if it's possible for God to save him, but in fact God isn't going to save him, then we've shown that God can do what he doesn't do. So 
Abbott's found a very good argument against his own position. Um, however, Abelard denies that consequence, and he denies the consequence by denying that, in fact, it's possible um, for him to be saved by God means the same as it's possible for God to save him. He agrees that if we just take the simple statement, God saves him, he is saved by God, they have exactly the same meaning. They're just two forms of words saying the same thing. But when you talk about possibility, that's that's not the case. Because he says that um, when, we're, when we're talking about what's it, that it, we say it's possible for him to be saved by God, we're referring possibility to him and to his capacities. And there Abelard would say, as Christian doctrine demands, that uh, of course it's possible for him to be saved by God because it's possible for any human being to be saved by, by God. You know, that, that possibility remains until the moment of their, of their death and damnation. But when we're talking about whether it's possible for God to save him, then it's different because we're talking about what's possible for God and given that in fact he has done evil and it would be unjust to save him, it's not possible for God to save him. Because he'd have to do something worse. He'd have to, well, yeah, he'd have to do something which, which was exactly wrong, which he'd have to do something unjust, which um, first of all would be against God's nature and secondly wouldn't be the best action that he could take. The, the best action in this case, is to do what's just and damn the man. Let me ask you a more basic question about Abelard's whole position here. Mm -hmm. Why not say that when God's making a decision Mm -hmm. like this, Mm -hmm. for example, whether to damn this sinner Mm -hmm. or not, Mm -hmm. he evaluates the situation, he sees what's best to do, and then he decides freely to do the best thing. In other words, why not say that his knowledge of what's best Mm -hmm. doesn't force him to do what's best. It just gives him a reason to do what's best, and then he acts on that reason. Even though he'd have the possibility of not acting on that reason. Because Abelard doesn't believe that he does have the ability of not acting on that reason, because not acting on that reason would mean that he wasn't doing the best thing. But that seems kind of circular. So uh, (laughs) what I'm saying is that, uh, I mean, you can't prove that God has no ability not to do the best thing just by insisting that he must do the best thing. But how, if if God is omniscient, omnipotent, and entirely good... Oh, so it's, it fl- actually flows from his nature. It, it, in, it, it flows from his nature. Good. And I mean, you, you of course, a, a, an obvious objection is you might say yes, but supposing there are two things which are equally good for him to do, Oh right, okay. That's, and so then, that's, then that's I mean, there better. must be some cases where, the, but uh, no, I mean, Abelard says there couldn't be a case like that, because supposing there were, then there'd be no reason why God should do one rather than the other, and so God would be acting without reason, and the, the, you know, the universe couldn't be like that. It could never be. So just as God can't do something unjust or yeah. wrong, he can't do anything arbitrary either. Exactly. So there must always be a best thing for him to do, and he must one do best, it. One best thing. Just exactly. by his yes. very nature, yes. is all-powerful, all-good, all-knowing. Exactly, yes. yes. I'm guessing that this position was not received with universal acclaim among later <laughs> philosophers. <laughs> I mean, it was, it, yeah, it was received with um, yeah, u- universal disdain. It, 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 um, so what happened was... It, it, um, there's actually an interesting discussion by Hugh of St. Victor. So a, a, a thinker of a very different caste, but, but, but quite an intelligent man, quite, quite near the time, where he goes through, he, he knows the argument, probably not from any source that actually survives now, but he knows it in some detail and he discusses it quite well. But then it gets taken up by Peter the Lombard, in his sentences, and this is a book which comes to be enormously influential and is used in the, all the theology faculties of the universities. Peter the Lombard takes up sort of a bit of the argument in a somewhat garbled version and rejects it out of hand. Everybody else knows the argument through Peter the Lombard. It's not, Peter the Lombard doesn't mention Abelard's name, he clearly has Abelard in mind. So people know this argument as a position and a position which the Lombard rejects, and 
they also reject it. Sometimes they devise more elaborate arguments than the Lombard himself had. The one person who seems perhaps to have some inkling uh, th that it's by Abelard is Aquinas, who in, I think it's his questions on power, refers to this position as having been taken by a certain Peter Amalario, <laughs> Amal which it seems as though in some sort of text this, is, this has come through to him. But anyway, it, it's something which is universally rejected uh, until, I mean, the one thinker who in some ways follows it but thinks he's rejecting it is, is, is the first thinker, or first sort of significant thinker, who you know, restores the parentage of the argument to Abelard, and that's, say, Leibniz. Leibniz, it seemed, in the end, didn't actually read uh, Abelard's um, Theologia, the Theologia Scholarium, or the Theologia Christiana, in which this argument is put. But he, he, he read an abbreviation of it. He discusses it quite, quite fully, and he rejects it, and he suggests that Abelard's view is completely different from his own. But actually, Leibniz finds himself in much the same sort of position, because he has, he has the same sort of view about God um, as always having to choose the best. So... You know, although, although Leibniz might say that when Abelard puts forward this argument, he's just playing with words, actually it's something which is <laughs> rather central to Leibniz's own thought and a, a difficulty for Leibniz himself. Okay, well, it will be a while till I get to Leibniz, but I will very soon be getting to people like Hugh of St. Victor and also yeah. Peter Lombard in the coming episodes, which will continue to look at philosophy in the 12th century. For now, I'll thank John Marenbond very much for coming on the podcast again. <laughs> Not at all. It's a great pleasure. And please join me next time for more on 12th century philosophy here on The History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps. <laughs> <laughs>